You know, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Robin, my wife and I, we shared our 25th wedding anniversary. Thank you. I know that for some of you out there, that is like a drop in the ocean, that uh, two, maybe a little bit more than two times you've been married that length of time. And, but for us, it was special. You know, uh, for those who are of the digital age, you know, when we got married, there was no digital age. And so, uh, you know what you do when it comes to celebrating that, you dive into your wedding albums, you know? Those things that are collecting dust somewhere in a back room or occasionally you have a look. And I, I was having a rummage through there to be able to take a, a digital photo so that I could upload that to social media. And, and as I did, I looked down at those pages and I thought, my goodness, what has happened to me? <laughs> it was only made worse by some of you that when it actually made social media, there were quite a number that said, Robin hasn't changed a bit <laughs> and not a word about me. Your silence spoke volumes, thank you. But here we are, this is us. Look at that. Hey. Wow. Isn't she beautiful? She's still beautiful. We're old school when it was our wedding day, Robin walked down the aisle and uh, you know guys uh, it's it's one of those moments you know you just get all teary and you you're standing there and it's you know exciting but it's nerve-wracking at the same time and we were old school she wore a veil and I was just kept thinking I'm nervous because I hope Rick hasn't swapped her out for somebody else you know <laughs> she doesn't have a sister but I sure hope it wasn't a brother <laughs> I didn't want to get hope he hadn't done some you know Old school Jacobin Laban trick on me. That's a Bible joke for those who don't know. Just go Google Laban and Jacob and you'll find that out. But I can remember at a special moment of the service when the bride is unveiled and you stand before, and there she stands before you in all her glorious beauty. And, and you just, you know, it's mem mesmerizing and your, your heart pounds and it's, it's, it's one of those, those special, special moments. Did you know that the Bible is actually full of an analogy where, where God presents himself to his people like a husband, like a bridegroom, and he calls for his people to present themselves like a bride. Did you know that? In Isaiah 62 verse 5, it has this sort of language. It says, for as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, says God, so shall your God rejoice over you. When God thinks about his people, that's the picture he's painting. The rejoicing, the singing over his people like a bridegroom. In Jeremiah chapter 31, God says, I am your husband to the nation of Israel. And Jesus makes good use of this analogy several times. We read through the Gospels where he's referring to himself like a bridegroom. And in Revelation, it says that he will be coming back like as a bridegroom to collect his spotless bride to him. In Ephesians 5, Paul takes it to even a, another level than that. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, here he is, wrote much of the New Testament that we'll read and those sorts of things today. And here he is describing to this newfound followers of Jesus, the disciples now grown out into the thousands that are spreading out through the, the near Middle East and other areas. And here he says to the church at Ephesus, he, meaning Jesus, gave up his life for her, meaning the church, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she'll be holy and without fault. And you get this wedding imagery, this beautiful imagery that Paul talks about, and he's actually talking about a husband and wife, and in midstream he changes and he starts to talk about Jesus and the church. And so it's like we, the church, God's people, are cared for, protected by, sacrificially loved by a faithful God who then desires that we, like a bride, 
would present ourselves to him as a glorious church, pure, faithful, holy, unveiled before the bridegroom. And that's what the world wants to see. I think the world is hungry to see a a pure, spotless, beautiful, glorious church. Not one they can easily throw stones at to say, you guys are hypocritical. You guys are just say one thing, you do another. But actually be able to unveil the very glorious nature of God himself to a people that need to see what God's love looks like. Today, most engagements happen a little like this. You get a guy and a girl who decide that they kind of like each other. They spend a little bit of time with each other. They spend even more time with each other. They're at the right kind of age where they'd be thinking, well, this might be really serious. So they just start spending even more time with each other. They start to talk about marriage. They start to talk about their love for one another. They start to talk about all the important things like what are your ambitions and goals in life? Where would you like to go in the future? They talk about the really important things like their finances, they talk about, you know, whether they're a dog or a cat person, all of these sorts of things come into the mix until finally they've talked about it so much they decide that, yes, we're going to get married. And and all it takes then is the, the waiting period for the guy to come up with the collateral, the little bit of bling to be able to say, would you marry me to be able to secure that deal and wait a little while. And then all focus and attention is on the actual ceremony, that time of coming together and the party that follows afterwards and that's kind of how it rolls today but in Hebrew culture so we're going to go right back even before the time of Jesus we're talking about a thousand years so before that when we start to think about how it looked in that culture it was much different it was, it was more that you would have an arranged marriage and it was actually the father's of the groom and the father of the bride who would decide. It was much more about families coming together. It was about this important family and this important family. If we connect those two together, that would be a good choice for my daughter. That would be a good choice for my son. That's the way it should go. And and so it was the fathers that would talk about this and connect and they would come up with an arrangement. They would come up with a conditions of marriage, almost like a contract and a a contractual arrangement called a, a betrothal. Now, Once betrothed, this is much more serious than our engagement, okay? This, our engagement is kind of like, you know, uh, well, I think I like him and she likes me and we're we're prepared to get married and we're heading that direction. Betrothal is more like we're actually married, but we haven't consummated the marriage yet. We haven't come together. I may not have even met the other team yet. I may not have met them, talked with them and all those sorts of things just yet. Sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. It changed over history. But it was a, a marriage contract that this betrothal came into arrangement right at the beginning via the two families meeting together, but it would come together sometime, maybe even a long time later, where the actual wedding ceremony would take place. And the groom or bridegroom would come and say, I will go and I'll prepare a place for you so that we can be together. And usually that's at his father's house somewhere or nearby. And she says, when will you come back to get me? And he says, well, it could be a long time, but I don't know the day, I don't know the hour, but my father does. And when he tells me, when he approves the wedding chamber that I will make for us, when he gives all the approval, well, then he's going to send me back and I'll come for you and bring you with me. And so they're committed to one another, even though they aren't always seeing. They're not dating each other like we know them to be dating And he finally goes to her father's house on that time, appointed time by his father to be able to, all the preparations have been done, the invitations have all been sent, it's all been ready to go and now he'll come and grab her and bring her to the ceremony and the celebration. Interestingly enough, I think there's this moment in the Bible where God actually proposes to his people. He comes like a father to another father. This time it's the the father of the universe. It's our father in heaven coming to the father of a nation, not the original father, but the one who was leading him at that point in time. He comes to Moses and God approaches Moses and says, 
I, I, I'm going to propose to you my people. And it, you read about it in Exodus chapter 34. They, they head up this mountain, Mount Sinai. And God invites Moses up and he presents them with a wedding contract, a little bit like a prenup. This is how it's going to play out. If I'm going to give myself fully to you as my people, like being a bridegroom, then I need you to respond in these sorts of ways. You shall have no other gods before me. Yeah. There's this idea that you're now entering into this relationship and God puts this out to the people of Israel. Well, he's, he's not even down and off this mountain, this Mount Sinai. The people are scared. There's rumbling, there's smoke, there's flames, there's noises, there's all sorts. He's gone for quite some time. And he's not only comes back down and he notices that the people under Aaron, his older brother's leadership, Moses' older brother, has actually now formed a calf out of all this gold and that Moses has been gone a while. They haven't heard God speak to them, only to Moses. So we're going to make this idol. And the prenup arrangement is broken even before Moses gets down the mountain. He smashes these tablets before him. And he's like, oh, I can't believe you people. You've been unfaithful. So God calls Moses back up the mountain. Moses heads back up just by himself. And when he's up there, he pleads with God, would you forgive us? We've been unfaithful. We've been unfaithful people. We just haven't really done it the way you've asked us to do it. We've, we've already turned away from you. This first one I wrote down on this tablet here, on this stone, I've engraved it. And I broke it because the first thing it said is we should have no other God before you. And we've done that even before I've got off the mountain. Anyway, God forgives them and God sits with Moses. 40 days and 40 nights, Moses spends time face to face in the presence of God on top of that mountain. It tells us in verse 38 of chapter 30, verse 28 of chapter 34 in Exodus, that during that time he did not eat nor did he drink. I don't go three or four hours without eating. 40 days without eating or drinking. I don't know. Maybe it was the presence of God that sustained Moses. But there's this miraculous thing that happens after spending this extended period of time beholding the image of God where this man, Moses, this leader of this people in whom God is proposing to, as these two fathers meet with one another in an arrangement of the marriage of what's to come. You have this imagery of Moses coming down, it says in Exodus, from the mountain and his face is shining with the glorious radiance of the glory of God. He probably didn't know it. I'll tell you what my face would look like after 40 days of not eating. <laughs> but here Moses is, is radiant. So much so that when he gets off the mountain, his brother Aaron, this time they didn't stuff up. This time they kind of like were in fear of what the Lord might do. They don't stuff up. He comes down and he's afraid of his brother. He's like, what am I looking at? The rest of the people, they're afraid. They won't look at him either because Moses is shining with the radiance of God's glory because he spent time in the presence of God. I want you to remember that. It's when we stop and we behold the presence of the glory of God that we are transformed into the image of the one in whom we are beholding. And people, it should look a little different when we've spent time in his presence and we gather around those who weren't there that they should be able to look and say to us, you look different. You look different going to be different when you leave here this morning because you've come into the presence of the living God you've fellowshiped with other believers but that's not the most important part it's important but the most important part is you came into his presence and as you came into his presence and you beheld him you will become what you behold and it made a difference it made a change in his life 
So much so that he took a veil and he veiled himself with, because the glory of God was temporary. It tells us that when he went back in to the meeting tent with, with God and Moses met face to face as a man would with his friend, it says in Exodus, that he would unveil himself, the glory again would fill in that place, he would shine again, and when he walked out so he didn't frighten the people, he would drop a veil down because this was a temporary glory it was a fading glory. And this story, it's great, but it's a long time ago. And so Paul, the author I was speaking about just before, speaks into this verse for us into the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he goes on to explain in chapter 3 the difference now that has come. Now, I want to link two things for you. Just focus just for one minute, would you? God the Father meets with Moses, the father of a nation, and they decide that there is a good prenuptial arrangement for God to marry his people. And so he sends his son, the bridegroom, Jesus, to come and to meet with his bride, the church. You getting it? When's he coming back to consummate the marriage? When the father says it's time. When they'll be ready. When the chamber is prepared. You know where I'm going, Jesus said. My father's house has many rooms. There's room for everybody, right? But I'll come back. When are you coming back? I don't know, Jesus said, but my father does. And when I come back, will you be ready? Will you be this spotless bride? Will you be this one that is transformed into my image so that when I take you because I am holy, you are holy and together it will be as it should. And Paul starts to explain this. And this is the difference between the, the old covenant and the new covenant. Jesus being the significant difference. How many of you would like to be Moses? Anybody? I kind of hold him right up here. Do you hold him up here? I mean, rightfully we should, right? You know, like, whoa, what's this thing do? Whoa. <laughs> Look at that. He met face to face with God to the point his face was transformed into a glorious, shining image of the Father. I'd like to be a little bit like Moses, but Paul tells me it's better to be me than it is to be Moses. It's better to be you than it is to be Moses. You're in a more privileged place than Moses. Listen to what it says. If you've got your Bibles there, open up. We're going to dig in for a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 3, it tells us the old covenant that was written on the tablets of stone, the ones that he chiseled away up the top of Mount Sinai. The new covenant is written on the heart. It's not on a tablet of stone anymore. Now it's in here, flesh and blood. It's within the spirit of mankind. Paul goes on to explain in verse 6 of chapter 3, the old covenant is the letter of the law, while the new covenant is the letter of the Spirit, meaning the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. So one was the letter of the law that killed, now we have the Spirit that brings life. We move on from verse 6 into verse 9, and the old covenant brings condemnation. You're guilty. Because you've broken, you've done wrong, the law has examined you and you're at fault before it. Whereas now in Jesus, you're under a covenant of righteousness. Being made clean, pure and holy by what he has done when he went to the cross. Not by anything we've done by our own measure. No longer living under the law of what we do and do not do, but what he has done. Verses 10 through to 11 in the same chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, the old covenant had a glory that faded. But the new covenant has a glory that remains and in fact far surpasses that of the old covenant. It appears that 
have no glory really in comparison. It has no glory in comparison. He came off the mountain shining. Every time he met face to face with God, his face was shining. Everyone knew that he'd met with the glorious God of the universe because he was shining so much that he veiled himself so they wouldn't be frightened and he could talk to them. But now, Paul says that that glory has nothing on the glory that's in you. Nothing on the glory that is taken up by the spirit that resides in your heart. Wow. I'm preaching myself happy. I don't know about you. (laughs) Listen to this. Chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. It'll be on the screen for you. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory even though it was destined to fade away. New covenant ministers, that's you and me. That's not just me, just because of my title. That's us, the church, we're all ministers, we're all a royal priesthood. That's what the Bible tells us in Hebrews, okay? So this is not just about me, I'm just paid to be good. You have to be good for free. (laughs) The new covenant ministers, that's you and me, proclaim the unfading glory in a bold manner. While Moses wore a veil that shielded Israel from the glory that he knew wasn't permanent. Newsflash. The glory of God in you is permanent. There's a condition for it to be seen. Want to know what the condition is? Okay, I'll tell you anyway. Here's the condition. Here's the point that Paul is making. God wants his glory on display through you as you walk in a new marriage covenant with him. That's what he wants. Here's how it's done. Are you ready? Verses 16 to 18. But when any, everyone, let's start that again. Verse 16. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, your version might say, behold. The Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Connecting dots. We become what we behold. And the Holy Spirit is now the evidence of this new covenant. For those that have the Spirit in their lives, the veil is now removed. And it's an unveiled freedom of access into the presence of the living God, set aside in the Old Testament for guys like Aaron and Moses only. Now all of us enter in with unveiled faces because the Holy Spirit is doing His work to no longer put any boundary or barrier between you and God the Father so that you might what it says at the end of that verse be transformed into the likeness of God so that your transformation would go from glory to glory not a, a, a an unveil a veiled glory that's temporary not a veiled glory that's going to fade but one that is just going to increase from glory to glory when you wake up in the morning and you look into the mirror is your face going to be shining with the glory of God when you arrive at work tomorrow is your face going to be shining with the glory of God When you get into that difficult situation that no doubt will come, is your face going to be shining with the glory of God? Will there be such a difference that's happened because the Spirit, as you stood with an unveiled face, 
before the glory of the Father done such a freedom act in you that you will now be presented differently to a world around you that desperately needs to see not the image of John Robertson, not the image of any one of us, but the image of him who we have beheld and we are becoming. That's, that's when the church makes a difference. You're going to see plastered everywhere this year. It's on the you know, River Life News. It's on the wall out there. It's going to appear everywhere, unveiled. Because the Spirit's done His job in allowing you access unveiled access into the fullness of God's glorious presence. The rest is up to you. Last year I received a vision. The vision I saw was like over our church and it was a massive column of fire. And there was a stream, a thick stream of oil that was coming down over the top. And our church took on, as square-like as it is, the, the, the image of, uh, of the covenant, and I'll explain this next week actually a little bit. Uh, the, in the courtyard, there was a brazen altar. It was a place where, back in Moses' time, they would come and they would, they would bring their sacrifice. And it would be barbecued, it would be fired up. This one had a stream of oil coming down and, and there was fire that was going back up this stream and the glorious fire of God's presence was over us as a church. And I could see that this could be seen from a long way away. This fire of God's presence could be seen throughout the city, throughout the nation. In fact, it could be seen across the nations of the world. And people were coming with torches that needed to be lit. And their torches were unlit. But when they came, this sanctifying, purifying, holy fire of God was there for them to be able to relight their torch. For them, to, And people were simply coming into the presence of God and being transformed and changed as they come into the nearness of His presence. Why? Because when you behold him, you'll become like him. When you get close enough to the holy fire of God, you're going to become like what Paul says, increasing glory to glory. Next week, I'm going to talk about what that looks like when we take that on board for an aspect of purity and holiness for us. Anyway, uh, I saw many people being attracted, many people coming even from these other nations. I can remember that the cry of my heart at that particular time was, Lord, would you again let your eye fall on us? Would we be a church, not just that would start a worldwide revival of, of power and of signs and wonders, but of a sanctifying holy fire that would go out throughout the nations? And when I asked the Lord what we needed to do, I felt like he said these two things. He said, it's only by my power. The fire is mine. Don't touch it. The oil is mine. It comes from heaven. I want you to pray and worship. I want you to pray and worship. That builds the fireplace. That builds the brazen altar. Prayer and worship. That's, that's what we're created to do. We pray and we worship and as we behold him, we become like him. As we behold him, his glorious presence is mirrored in us. As we behold him, his life-changing presence by his spirit brings us to glory with him so that the world would see him. Now, I have a very long list of the things I think this will do and make change for us as a church. I have vision for what this looks like, but it will pale into insignificance in comparison to the list that God has when he would have his people, not just his person, but his people unified in a hunger that we would have of coming into his presence. And that as we prioritize beholding him, we become like him. And imagine 4,800 beholding saints going out into a city to make a difference. Come on, think about that. That's going to be exciting. 
And you can join the journey. It's there for all of us. It's his presence. And that's the potential as a church that we need to commit to seeking his presence so that we can be this beacon of light, of fire together for the glory of God. Prayer and worship are going to be our priority. You see, you cannot pursue his presence and not be unveiled. It's the freedom of being unveiled that the spirit allows us into his presence. But you're also going to have to unveil your heart. The Spirit does his job by allowing us access. Do you want access? It's only the hungry. We've got to take time to behold him. When we have a prayer meeting, will you prioritize it? Turn up. I want to behold his presence. This is the fireplace where the fire of God's presence dwells. It's in the heart of every believer, but it's also in the corporate identity of his church. And so in his presence, we need to be committed. He allows us access. We must be committed. Committed to coming hungry. Committed to coming weekly. Committed to generously giving of our finances. Committed to tithing. Committed to serving and becoming completely surrendered to him. You see, there's space for everyone and everyone is needed for River Life to reach its potential in 2019. Why? Because it's limited by those who will accept the invitation to come with unveiled faces and behold him. And when River Life is unveiled, when we together do this, here are some of the things I believe is God's going to bring to life in and through us as a church. This is what I see. I see that we gather en masse as a citywide prayer movement, inspiring all denominations to gather together in relationship, desperate to see the city of Brisbane one for Christ. I see that we would have influence amongst the decision makers and politicians and key business people of this city. I see that we'd have significant partnerships overseas where we're totally committed. Transformation is taking place. Meeting local infrastructure needs, uh, schools and homes and churches. We'd have church plans, leadership development, sustainable work with a very strong River Life active involvement. A home for compassion ministry, centralized in a community of need, serving as a base to reach our local community through practical help like food banks and clothing centers and a base for our street teams ministry. That we'd have a prayer and worship center annexed to our life center, fully self-contained in its premises. A school of revivalists. In 2020, we're going to launch River Life Revival School. Going to be an opportunity, a place that we're preparing for this year where hungry people from River Life and from beyond will come to shore up a firm leadership foundation steeped in the culture of a presence-based community. I see a church where there's never any financial lack to accomplish the thing God's calling us to. We currently have $11 million debt. It would be awesome to see that go. So that our budget isn't chewed up with paying down debt, but it can be advanced in doing the things God's calling us to do. Like I said, I could go on and on, but I believe that God has something bigger and better for that we can even dream or imagine because that's the kind of father he is. He's made a way. The priority for us must be to enter in. I'm not going to preach to you this morning about the programs we're dreaming up. Because without his presence, it means nothing. Unless we labor with him, we're going to labor in vain. He requires us to come and behold him. And when we do, the freedom of the Spirit 
will transform us into the glorious image, an image that this world needs to see. And all the other stuff, it'll come behind, but it's gonna require that each of us say, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'll behold him. I'll commit myself. This is my family. I'll commit myself. I'm the bride waiting the return of the bridegroom. I'll commit myself to purity. I'll commit myself to holiness. I'll commit myself to his presence. And all the other stuff, it'll come. Watch the seats fill up. Multiple services start happening. Not when we do anything fancy or bigger or better or whatever it might be. Watch it when the presence of God dwells in a place, people will come from everywhere. You know what? They said the attractional church model doesn't work. And you know what? They were right. They were right and they were wrong. They were right because the attractional church model does not work when you're trying to attract people from the city into do not know God, into the presence of a man-made facility and church where all they come to see is what man can do. Let me tell you how attractional church works. When the presence of God dwells, thou come. When the presence of God, transformational, spirit-led move of God is changing hearts and lives, they'll come. We don't have to make it sensitive. We don't have to make it seeker-friendly. The presence of God has never been seeker-friendly. Loving, yes. Caring, compassionate, yes. Kind and generous, yes. Safe, no. Why? Because we're not coming for anything about us, it's about Him. It's going to take all of us to host His presence. It's going to take every one of us to host His presence. These guys work at it all week. What about you? Do you work at it all week? The difference in our church this year must be that you work at it to come here on a Sunday morning. And church is not all about Sunday morning. It's just that's when we gather together. And some of you have fallen into the bad habit. I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but hopefully someone will pick this up on, online. We've fallen into the habit. Hebrews tells us, the Hebrews writer tells us not to fall into it which is the habit of not meeting together, of forsaking coming together. But when we come, we've got to come with hearts that are prepared, hearts that are ready. We've got to come ready with our finances. We've got to come ready with our heart. We've got to come ready to give of ourselves. We've got to come ready. You're like a little bit of firewood. And when you bring your firewood into the fire and the consuming presence of God lights you up, you go out like a hot coal into a place, but then you need to come back in. What do you do to prepare yourself to come? What do you bring with you? They practice all week to bring us into His presence. The Holy Spirit has done whatever was needed to remove any veil so we could come unveiled. What are you doing? Do you need to come 15 minutes earlier? It's good for car parking. It's good if the machines break down and kids sign on. But you know what it's even better for? It's better so you might come. What if we sat? What if I walked into church 10 minutes before 9 o'clock and saw half the number of people who are here right now just sitting in His presence, just waiting because they were preparing their heart they are preparing themselves to come so that they might behold all that He is with an unveiled face. 
Because it's not about me coming to get what I like or what I don't like. Or did we sing the song I desperately wanted to sing? Was it the way I wanted it or not? But we come and we behold. And when we behold, then we will become like Him. And we'll leave and we'll make a difference. Would you stand? Let's stand together in His presence.